Thank you. Sure. And you guys will get a copy of that afterward as well. So I briefly shared the agenda with you, the five obstacles, the improvement path, leaders and managers. Uh, we're going to talk just a little bit about that. It's an important topic. And then Fran's story, the TLI process uh, using Fran's story. So a little bit about me. I graduated from Arkansas State University, which I'm now employed through the university. Um, did that, graduated in 93, started out in my first real job, if you will, at a place called Plastine Supply Company up in the Boot Hill, Missouri as an HR manager. And actually I was a second shift HR manager, but this plan had 1,100 people. So just the second shift had uh, 350 people on it. So a pretty big job there. From there, I moved to a company called Columbia Forest Products and I had two locations as an HR manager there, one in Truman and one in Dequeen. And the way I tell it is those two were about as far away uh, in the state as you could get and still be in Arkansas. So I did that for three years and then uh, path I shared in my in my uh, blog my article that I was part of a kind of a brat pack of up and coming HR professionals and we wanted to run plants and rule the world and in order to do that we most of us transitioned into technical roles and for me that was an industrial engineer position there at Columbia so fast forward six years later I'm working with anchor packaging and they're starting this thing that they're calling their continuous improvement program and they came to me and said you know, you seem like a guy who works well with teams and kind of has a bent for this thing. We're starting this program. We're working with a company called, or an entity called Arkansas Manufacturing Solutions. We want you to be the CI leader. And that was in 2006. And little did I know that I would later end up joining that team in 2014. So I met really smart guys like Charlie Appleby, who was on the team at that time, Bill Krause, and some others. And I actually still work with Bill. In 2009, I got a chance to run, a, run an operation, which is something that was kind of part of the vision all the way back in 2000. Uh, I got a chance to run the auto pack division for anchor packaging with the good Lord's help, took that from worst to first, uh, working with a great team there. And then kind of got that lined out and they said, hey, we want you to be the director of quality. And that started in 2011 and I did that until I got a chance to join the Arkansas Manufacturing Solutions team in 2014. And the way I tell it is I haven't gone to work a day since then because I just absolutely love what I get to, get to do here, work with leaders across the state and help make things better. So, and this is a kind of a poll the audience thing. So if you're interested in participating, you can just come off mute and share. Here's the question that I'm asking as it relates to transformational improvement. Why do so few improvement efforts produce the results that leaders and business sponsors want? What's in the way? I'm interested to hear from, from the participants. Lack of follow through. Lack of follow through, that's a good one. What else? Lack of alignment. The other okay. Group, complete buy-in. That sounds like Bland Hurt. I can't see. Is that right? Yeah, that's me. Okay, so lack of alignment, and then which which ways are we misaligned, Bland? Well, just lack of buy-in from the whole group. Different levels of buy-in. Some some may be all in. Some may be part way in. Some may not be in. Okay, that's a good one. What else? I think silos too. Uh, where I work, we have a lot of silos and and uh, protect, protection of turf, basically. And that makes it, um, there's not as much of an incentive and, and we're more of a federated environment anyway. So there's, it's, it's really lead by influence and collaboration more than it is command and control. Mm, yeah, that's a good one. So we've got turf warfare, we've got silos and that connects in a way back to what Blant was sharing about alignment, doesn't it? Lack yeah. of uh, leadership buy-in. Um, Usually it's a pet project from uh, of somebody, but the leadership is not by, uh, bought in. Okay. Yeah, and so that can happen at different levels of system, can it? It can be the executive leadership team because this is coming in from corporate. It could be the individual leader saying, hey, this is flavor of the month, right? Too many grass fires to put out. <laughs> Was that Ray? Yes. Yeah, too many, you, you use the term grass fires. I think in word pictures and metaphors, so that really fueled my brain. Too many grass fires to put out, I don't like that. Let's take one or two more. A 
could be different structures that have been used and still are being used that get in the way. Different structures. And what are you thinking of when you say structures? Um, processes, the way things have always been done. Different mm. silos again. Okay. Yeah, that's good. So we've got silos, we've got the way things have always been done. And, you know, that's about habit. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. So those are good obstacles. I'm going to show you five. Uh, and these are not all the obstacles. These are just five. You guys have given some really good ones for why we failed to hit those transformational results that we all want. So here's the five we're going to kind of unpack and I'm going to give you some solutions for today. First is symbolized by the, the hand here, the absence of learning, tension and support. And you're going to find out this also relates to the improvement path. The idea of learning tension is really important. It's one of the main obstacles for leaders. The things you guys talked about alignment, fully engaging, is there needs to be a sense of learning tension. Learning tension happens whenever a leader sits down with the person that they're leading that's going through the training and just has a conversation with them. And they share, these are my expectations right? This is what I'd like to see in terms of your level of engagement, how I'd like to see you function inside the class, and then talk about some outcomes as well. And by the way, what's the support that you need from me? So that's learning tension and support. I've got it as the biggest icon here in number one. Another obstacle is no frame of reference for what needs to be improved, right? So leadership is it's a big fuzzy abstract thing, right? So the way I describe it is again, using metaphor is we need to be able to give those leaders some handles to be able to pick up their leadership and move it forward. In fact, we wanna move it into a specific direction. Third obstacle, no context for why improvement is needed in many cases. So leaders were promoted and you know you can assume from that or they could assume hey i'm doing the right stuff right i got promoted for some reason so why do i need to change right what's the context for why improvement is needed that's the third obstacle fourth obstacle fear and insecurity of using those new tools and approaches and i i use these words fear and insecurity with some trepidation because you know there's a lot of us out there that don't really like to think about, you know, those words, you know, us being subject to those things, but it you can call it reticence or hesitancy or whatever words that you want to put in there. It's the idea that we tend to stay in a habitual mode, the things that we're comfortable doing and anything that's new or different, particularly in an environment where we're really busy already and things are highly urgent. There's a, a, a reticence, a fear, maybe an insecurity of using new tools and approaches that are being taught in, in the, in the course. And then the fifth obstacle, trying to focus on too many things at one time. So let's focus anybody. And you know, I'm talking to uh, people in economic development and chambers and in education and a lot of different venues, you know, a lot, a lot of formats, I know in the webinar today, but primarily where we work is in manufacturing, and I'm sure it's the same in those other sectors. Folks, leaders are busy. I know I'm not telling anybody on this webinar or something that they didn't already know. There are tons of things competing for our time and attention. And what gets in the way of really transforming our leadership is just trying to do too many things at one time. So if you've seen the webinar, or if you've seen the, um, the article that I wrote, this is about spending time in the wedge. And I actually lifted that from one of the clients that we work with. Uh, he actually coined the phrase spend time in the wedge. And the idea is, you know, 85 to 90 percent of our time is the whirlwind. It's that daily activity that must occur. You know, that can't go away because that's the work. That's the business. So in that 10 to 15 percent of the time that we have to do proactive things, we need to, to be able to focus. And now I've shared this quote with you by Winston Churchill. We shape our buildings. Thereafter, they shape us. I use this when I'm working with clients in culture. I think it's a really insightful uh, quote by Winston. And the idea is culturally, you know, we start something new and the way that we do things just naturally kind of manifest or occurs over time, sometimes by design, but more often it's just kind of what happens as we're doing stuff, right? The core values of the leaders that come in that started the business start to inform how we're doing things and this culture forms and once that happens, then the culture starts forming us. So we form the culture and then the culture starts forming us. And it's the same way with our leadership, 
right? We start doing things a certain way early on, typically in our career, and then that becomes habit. We develop this super highway in a neural pathway in our brain, and that's just how we function after that. So the idea is to be more aware, more intentional, develop some vision and direction for our leadership and be more intentional, intentional about how we show up and how we iterate towards those goals. So questions, comments so far, I'm just gonna pause here. I'm getting ready to move into the improvement path. Any comments or insights? Okay. Keith, Marina had typed in uh, a couple of questions. I don't know if you want to try to address them now. Sure, go ahead and read the first one, Bob, if you would. Sure, she had asked with transformational leadership, how do you suggest introducing this into leadership conversations or executive coaching when leaders are so focused on the bottom line or putting out fires as Ray had also said? Let me just say this about that, and it goes back to what Blant was saying earlier, and that's about alignment. This is, if you really truly want to transform the leadership um, of your team, it has to start, I'm not saying anything that's, you know, anything new to anyone here, it has to start with that site leader, the top leader, right? So I'm glad to work with people at every level of the organization, but for significant transformation to occur, that top decision maker, that top decision making team at the organization must be bought in. And the way that I would address that is just to kind of cast vision like I'm doing right here with you guys about what could be as it relates to this leadership space, right? So just do an effective job of casting that vision, letting the person know what it's about, kind of how they, uh, you know, engage in it, what it means for them and for the business. What's the other one, Bob? Well, as you were talking about, you know, top leadership, her other question was about executive coaching and okay. she wanted to find more about leadership development aspect of leadership rather than just day-to-day -day, um, problems that leaders face. Okay. So that was Maria. Maria, thank you for that. That is a perfect soft pitch and I have some slides specific to that. So I'm gonna talk about specifically that topic. And if you wanna expand on that, or if you want me to after those slides, we'll circle back around to that. So thank you for that. So what I'm getting ready to share with everyone is literally going to transform your thinking. This is such a big idea that if the power fails after this section, value still would have happened. This is gonna be a paradigm shift for you as I bring this in. Those of you who I've worked with, this is, um, you've seen this before. So rep repetition is a good thing. It's a reminder for you and for others, this is gonna be new insight. You can see in the bottom left-hand corner of my screen, it says based on the Toyota Kata model developed by Mike Rother. So we're in a lean manufacturing space where we're working with manufacturing leaders. Uh, and years ago, Mike Rother wrote a book called Toyota Kata. This was back circa 2009. And when I got a hold of this, it, it transformed my thinking for how I think about any kind of improvement. And what we've basically done is overlay leadership improvement in this improvement path model here. So anything that's ever been built started with vision. I call it the first creation. It's created in someone's mind. And you can think about that as vision. And every leader has vision, whether you realize it or not. If you've ever gone on vacation, you have vision because you were thinking about all those things that you wanted to do and how life was going to be better in that future state when you were on vacation. So we call that a zero step here in the improvement path. That happens once or once in a great while, that vision piece. Typically that happens through some type of planning process. Once we've established the vision, we step back and you can think about the vision as a compass heading. That is a beyond the horizon compass heading in this case for your leadership. So now we're going to step back from that and we're looking 12 to 18 months out, and we're going to set a challenge theme for your leadership. You can think about that as a goal setting process. And when we have these two things for our leadership, we have something really important, and that's direction. Now we have a particular direction that we can iterate towards. Now that those two things are established, we go to the second step, which is we establish where are we right now through the lens of our vision and challenge. So we're gonna quantify the current state relative to our challenge theme or our longer term goals, right? That typically happens through some type of assessment process. It can be formal. We use a number of formal assessments and it can be just um, gimbal walk kind of 
uh, informal assessment, just paying attention to where you're at right now. Once you have these three things, you have something that's super important for your leadership or for the organization. I call it healthy tension. Healthy tension is as if you have taken a rubber band and stretched it into the future. And now you have this sense of something that's compelling you or drawing you into a particular direction. Now, each of you on this webinar have probably been in an organization or in a role where this was absent. And maybe you didn't realize that this is what was absent. It just felt like every day was like the last, right? So in my blog, I talked about Bill Murray and Groundhog Day, and that's how it feels going to work every day. There's no sense of momentum or direction or movement. It's as if you're on the hamster wheel and you're just running in place. So once we know where we're at in our current condition, we're gonna set a short-term goal. Mike Rother would call this a target condition, but for the improvement path and for our conversation today, we're just gonna call it a short-term goal. A short-term goal is looking out four to six weeks. Where do we wanna be that's gonna take us towards our challenge theme and beyond where we're at right now in our current condition? What will ha naturally happen is the cloud of obstacles, the things that are in the way of the target condition will naturally come into focus. Those things existed, they're already there, or we would already be at that target condition. Now here's the, one of the big ideas with the model, with the idea. We tend to start in our improvement efforts in this obstacle cloud, right? So if we're doing 5S, you know, we, we say the plant's dirty, let's start cleaning up the plant. It's never going to be a wrong thing to do 5S, right? If we're talking about our leadership, maybe we say, hey, there's a book out by Lanchoni and it's great, right? or I'm gonna to go to this webinar, or I'm gonna take an assessment, right? So we, we, we kind of start in the obstacle cloud and Bill Krause, my teammate would call that industrial whack-a-mole because it's a target rich environment. There's tons of obstacles. So here's what we wanna do instead. We wanna have clarity on working on only the obstacle that's between on as best we can tell the most direct path between us and the next target condition. Though that's all we want to work on. That's purpose-driven, focused activity. Once we reach that next target condition, what do we would we do next? What do we want to do when we reach that short-term goal? We want to set another short-term goal. And then when we reach that short-term goal, we want to set another short-term goal until we eventually reach our challenge theme. Maybe that took 12 months or 18 months. We don't know, right? Maybe it took 10 months. Maybe it takes a little bit longer. The idea is to iterate from target condition to target condition through these obstacles until we reach our challenge theme. And now you'll notice that there's these two lines here. That means once we reach that challenge theme, the process starts over, right? We're gonna set a new challenge theme that takes us even closer towards our vision. And then we're gonna go back, assess where we're at. That new challenge theme really becomes the current condition, right? And so we have new targets, new goals, and then we repeat the process. So it's lather, rinse, repeat. And here's something, I don't know who Robert Brock is. I looked him up, it just said he's a blogger, but it's a good quote here. We're kept from our goals, not by obstacles, but by a clear path to a lesser goal. And that's a huge idea. So when I'm doing planning of any kind with leaders, I tell them what this model helps us do is to distinguish what's an obstacle on our path that we must iterate through to reach our goals and our vision versus a distraction, right? So what we'll have a tendency to do leaders is veer off the path when we reach an obstacle because we don't recognize that we've got to go through that to get to our goals because we haven't set the compass heading. Or we have a tendency to veer off the path to something that looks like an opportunity, but if we actually had these components in place, we would recognize it for what it is, which is a distraction. So I'm gonna pause and give you guys a chance to throw in questions, insights, or observations. Yeah, check the chat room, there are no questions. So feel free to speak up if you have a question. Okay, I'm gonna interpret this as me doing such a good job of explaining it that we're okay to move on here. So 
We're going to shift now. You'll remember in our agenda, we were going to talk a little bit about leadership and management. And you'll notice down at the bottom of my slide here, it says leadership versus management. So what we tend to do is approach this topic as a dichotomy, right? We, we, we approach it as a binary. It's either leadership or it's management. And this quote from Yogi Berra reminded me of the old management school chestnut, right? So there's a leader and a manager and they're in the jungle and they're hacking their way through it. And the leader climbs a tree and he looks around, he comes back down and he says to the manager, we're in the wrong jungle. And the manager says, but we're making good time, right? I know that's a chestnut, but it's a good one. And this, this Yogi's quote reminded me of this. So what I want to do is just spend a few minutes talking about these functions. And Maria teed this up for me. So this is right in the wheelhouse of uh, what we're going to talk about in this section. And the question is, what's our focus, right? So what's our focus with leadership versus management? So I'm going to bring these in for you guys and kind of do uh, a one at a time slide build. So leadership functions, it's about coping with change. Leadership is about change. It's about a longer term focus typically, and it's about people. If you think about it, you don't lead machinery. You don't lead materials. You don't lead schedules. You lead people. So the focus of leadership is always going to be people. Over on the management side, the focus is about complexity. So leadership is about change. Management is about sameness. It's about coping with complexity and bring order to it. It's about day-to-day -day or shorter term focus typically. And it's more about things and stuff and also people. Leadership is about vision and direction. It's about setting direction and taking people in a new direction. So I use the example of a trail guide. So if you employed a trail guide to take you, let's say your management team, you guys were going on a walk about out there and you got down to base camp and the trail guide said, okay, now what we're gonna do is organize our tents and we're actually, what we're gonna do is 5S. We're gonna, our campfire is gonna be in a perfect circle. We're gonna have footprints for where the garbage cans go. All the packs are gonna be organized and sorted by color, right? And that was the day. Would you re-employ that trail guide? Of course not. And the reason is, is because you're employing that trail guide to take you somewhere. On the management side, it's about project oversight right? Executing a plan project. It's about efficiency and effectiveness. Now, as you think about these two things, it's not either or, right? You guys are starting to see that. These are both really important functions. Leadership is about inspiring and motivating. You can think about this as the coach's halftime locker room speech, right? So the coach is casting vision and in the vision, the team is winning the game, okay? The, the vision is we're going to score more points. We're going to make, we're going to get that ball into the end zone more times than our opponent. And then when we go back out on the field, the coach is going to send in plays. That's the manager side of this to help accomplish that vision. Staffing, the focus in, in staffing and leadership is about creating that org st structure, right? It's about that future creation. What are the roles and the types of uh, hierarchy that we need to support our growth goals, to support our vision for the organization. Management is about getting those open positions filled, right? Important functions, both of those. Leadership is about challenging the status quo. That could be challenging the process, challenging the people. It's really the heart of innovation. Management is about those daily production goals. Those are also important, right? We wanna win the game, but we wanna, we wanna also get first downs, right? One play at a time. And then finally here, leadership is about, as I shared at the beginning, focusing on the people. What are the needs of our constituents, the people that we lead to be heard and understood, to know their ideas are valued, to feel respected, to be involved, to be supported and trusted, et cetera. Management is also about people, but also focusing on the needs of the process, budgets, process parameters, procur procuring supplies, maintaining equipment, et cetera. So I need a volunteer from the TV studio audience for this next section. Who will volunteer to be our guinea pig? It can't be somebody that I've worked with before because you guys know what I'm getting ready to do here. Jeremy, I see you're in. Would you be, would you be my guinea pig, Jeremy Miller? Yeah, sure. Okay, you, you sound pretty stoked about that. So Jeremy, I'm getting ready. To, <laughs> so I'm getting ready to, everybody wants to speak in public, right? Yep. I'm getting ready to, to pull in a picture here. And when I do, I need you to pretend like I've been struck blind. I can't see this picture and I want you to describe it as accurately and as vividly as you can. 
Now, what you're going to see are some black or brown things, right? They're cylindrical, and I want you to start describing those when I bring them in with vivid detail to bring those to life for me. Will you do that? I'll give it a shot. Okay, here we go. So tell me what you're seeing. What do these cylinders look like? Jeez. These are dark, then one, two, three. So five dark brown cylinders. Five dark brown cylinders. Are they shiny or are they dull? Uh, kind of in the middle. Um, they're reflecting light a bit, or you can see the light casting shadows on them. Okay. And they are arranged in a way, they're turned, um, turned wood and polished. Okay. And they are like arranged, a table leg. Uh, yeah, like a table leg, exactly. Okay. Good yeah. Point. Kind of a first impression was a bit like chess pieces. Okay, yeah. They look, are uh, they all the same? Or do they all look like the same chess piece? No, they are, are different. Um, they are, let's say, in sets of three, even though there's five. So let's say the, the left three, including the middle one there, and then the right three um, are kind of paired and make a shape. So if you, if you look through them, they give you the impression of two ladies facing each other. Whoa, wait a minute. Now you just said something different. <laughs> you said something different. Yeah. You said yeah. that there was something now about what's between those things. Yes, the empty space appears okay. to make a picture for you. Okay. Um, a lady probably in a robe standing. Jeremy, now why did it take you so long to get to that? Because I focused on what was instead of what wasn't. So why <laughs> like, did you why did you focus on that other stuff? Uh, it was the immediate apparent. Because I told you to focus on it. Yeah, it could be too, yeah. Yeah, so where was I directing your attention? Line. Where was I directing your focus? On the wood, the, on the objects. Okay, I was directing, and you can think about those as your processes, Jeremy, and your organization. And I, as your leader of this exercise, was directing your focus continually to those processes. The longer I did that, the harder and harder it got to do what? Tell you about the ladies? To see the people, the people mm -hmm. between the processes. This is the way it is, leaders back at the ranch, we have this tendency to put most or all of our focus on these processes. And the more that we do that, the harder and harder it gets to see the people who are actually what make these processes work. Jeremy, you did an awesome job. I appreciate you playing along. So I'm gonna pause for reflection here. Anybody got a question? So the idea is this is not a dichotomy, it's about both. We need leadership and management. Now my observation in the 28 years that I've been in the game, the last seven of that working exclusively with leaders in coaching, consulting and training is that predominantly our focus is on that management side. I do notice that leaders tend to have a bent towards one or the other of those things, but I almost never when I'm working with a leader in the coaching context, have to get them to think about how to improve their operation, right? Most of the energy is around, let's pay attention to this other side over here, right? This other polarity. These are both wants, right? We want management and we want leadership. We tend to hang out more on that pole around management and less on that pole around leadership. Okay, so I'm going to bring in Fran's story here and you can kind of see how we did that with Fran. Again, if you're joining us um, after the, the blog, then you know this Fran's story. So Fran works with shots bottling and Fran engaged us to, uh, along with Mike, her leader, to transform her leadership. And this is kind of a behind the scenes tour. So I gave you kind of a high level look at what those five obstacles Fran was facing and kind of some chunks for how we address that. But I'm going to give you some more of the details here. So with Fran, the first thing was, and this is going back to our improvement path, really quick thing on the improvement path, and it's down in the bottom left corner here. The cool thing about it is this works for any level of system, right? If you want to improve the organization as a whole, this works. If you want to improve an individual department, the city, right? Whatever it is, this works. If you want to improve your leadership, this works. Hey, if you want to improve your marriage, okay? this works so this works at any level of system so we're on the zero step here of the improvement path called vision 
So Fran developed her division, her vision by working with her AEDC Manufacturing Solutions coach, as well as her core values. And you can see this is the leader workbook here. So this is the way that we would work uh, in the TLI process. These are vision elements at the top. That's crafted into a narrative here, a compelling narrative. The idea is we want Fran to create her vision in a compelling way so that it compels her and others into her future state. And then those values, the values really drive our behavior and decisions. That's why it's important we pay attention to them. This is addressing obstacle number two also, what needs to be improved. So we're giving Fran some handles to pick her leadership up and why improvement is needed. The next thing was Fran established uh, or Mike established expectations and support for Fran. So she met with Mike. He laid out his expectations and support. And what I've got in here is a formal tool called the Development Action Planner that uh, DDI has, but it doesn't have to be a formal tool. It can literally be just a coffee table conversation where Mike sits down before the, the development activity and says, hey, this is what I'd like to see. I'd like to see your full engagement. I'd, I'd like for you to be on time for those sessions, do the work that's in between sessions and engage me with whatever support that you need. And what this is doing is addressing that learning tension and support obstacle and also what to improve. So now we're on improvement path step one challenge. Fran develops a mid, what I would call midterm goals. So the vision is the beyond the horizon and kind of at the horizon where we can kind of see it as the midterm goals that would help take her towards her vision. This is the coaching workbook. There's some cool things happening in here that we don't have a lot of time in the webinar for, but in this particular instance, Fran used leadership mirror. Okay, and we're gonna talk about that in a second. So she had specific competencies for her supervisor role that fell into these different business domains. Also cross-reference to those Q12 engagement factors. And then she set some challenge themes for herself around each one of those competencies up there. And what that's doing is hitting that obstacle, what to improve and why improvement is needed. Okay, now I need to shift. I need to do something different because I have this vision for my leadership and these goals that I'm trying to achieve. So in the improvement path, we're on step two now, which is framing that current state relative to those goals, okay? We did that for the organization with this tool called a leadership needs analysis. So this is to help us pick the top most critical needed modules. In this case, we would be using DDI, frontline leadership training materials, but you could, you know, you could do this kind of assessment with, with any materials. And what this is doing is helping, again, at the organizational system level, know what we need to improve on, what we need to focus on. And then for Fran, we did a similar thing by developing a competency model. The competency model are those critical competencies that define 80 to 85% of her job or more, and then the key actions associated with each one of those competencies. And that helps her again know what to improve on. And then this is leadership mirror. So Fran invited Mike to give her some feedback on these competencies and key actions, some of her direct reports and some of her peers. And Fran, we use this tool called Leadership Mirror by DDI to do that. So this is a way to define a quantifiable baseline or current state for Fran's leadership. And again, this is helping us determine what to improve on. Next thing is to set some short-term goals. That's the target condition in the improvement uh, path model and track those over time. And that's what the coaching workbook for tracking looks like for Fran. And what's that doing is doing is helping Fran again determine why improvement is needed. Okay, I want to move from a 1.75 to a 2.5 on this competency. I know that I need to work on some obstacles and do something different to get there. Also, it helps us to focus, right? We're only working on the obstacle that's on the most direct path between us and that target condition. The next step here, we're just in step four of the improvement model is looking at the obstacles that are in the path. Okay, I wanna be at a 2.5, I'm at a 1.75 right now, what's in the way of that? And then we've got a tool in the workbook to do that. This is the obstacle parking lot. And you can see in this example, Fran is working on competencies in her competency model. She's working on three, six and nine, which is adaptability coaching and creating a culture of trust. And you can see that these that are bolded here are the ones that she's experimenting with or wants to experiment with. This is the one that Fran thinks is the, the, big, the biggest obstacle that she needs to work on to reach her goal in, in coaching. And what this does again is help her to focus, right? Of all the things that she could be working on, what must she work on to iterate through that obstacle? And in this case, Fran chose 
that uh, the obstacle was she was unfamiliar with the discussion planner to work on. So now Fran was is going to conduct some experiments. The experiment is this is what I think will happen. Here's what I want to do and here's what I think will happen. That's simply, you know, all an experiment is a little experiment to work through that obstacle. And this is the PDCA experiment record. So her challenge here on this competency was to improve coaching from 2.7 to 3.5. The obstacle that was in the way of the short-term goal that she had was unfamiliar with the discussion planner. So in the initial coaching conversation here, Fran wanted to use the discussion planner to have a proactive coaching conversation with Joe Smith. And what she expected was to help Joe be better prepared to do a line changeover and familiarize herself, get more familiar with the discussion planner. So you can see in the cycle, that was a coaching cycle. And then Fran goes and does the experiment. And then when we come back in the next coaching, session fran says what happened well i had i did the discussion planner conversation with joe here's what i learned the discussion planner helped keep me focused also i learned that joe had never done a changeover on that line by himself and he was nervous about doing that and wanted help with a more experienced operator so next coaching cycle or for the next step in that coaching cycle what do you want to do fran based on what happened and what you learned well, Fran wanted to use the discussion planner to have a reactive coaching conversation. Now, Joe's performed the task. She wanted to circle back around and find out what could be better for the next time. And what she expected was to find out how the changeover went from his perspective and identify other supported needs and to get better at using the discussion planner. And this is the secret sauce. This is the engine of improvement. All those other components are important. What this is doing is helping Fran overcome fear and insecurity by doing it one baby step at a time with focus, right? And just planning it, it can't go wrong. You can't, you know, any, any outcome is success in an experiment because really the goal is to learn something, right? And then it help addresses the obstacle of focusing on too many things. And you can see what's coming in down here at the bottom is this iterative process here. So we're gonna, follow this process. We're gonna pick a new target condition when we hit that one and then a new target condition. And then when we reach our challenge uh, theme, we're gonna start the process over again. So that is a really high flyby of the TLI process. And here's what it looks like kind of on one page. Develop the long-term leadership vision with 12 to 18 month goals as the challenge theme, finding out where you're at in your current state setting those short-term goals, identifying the obstacles that are between you and those goals, and then iterating through those with the PDCA experimental approach with coaching support and feedback. Questions, insights, comments? Okay, I see a question here I'll address. What are the, what are ways these documents are managed? Is it a learning management system or a Google Drive docs? So right now this is living inside of an Excel spreadsheet. Maria, that would be wonderful to be able to move this into a learning management system or a Google Drive. Um, so that sounds like a, a, a good idea for an iterative step. Right now it's living in an Excel workbook that initially the coach starts and then the learner keeps. What are the questions you have? Keith, there was a question about um, leadership resistance to transformation or pushing back uh, with a coach when some of the um, learning is towards growth or their inner work. Bob, thank you for that. So uh, I'm going to I'm going to respond and whoever asked the question, if I'm not hitting on what the intent of your question was, let me know. Uh, so the, the learners resistance to change. That was the idea, you know, the idea with the approach is you're breaking down. It was resistance. the leaders, leadership resistance to change. Leadership. Yes. Okay, the leadership resistance to change. Yeah. So this process, again, can happen at any level of system. So I could drop in with Fran. Um, and she would, you know, Fran would improve her leadership by following this model. What is going to be most effective is if this, the entry point for the process happens at top leadership, right? I know that's kind of the textbook canned answer, but if the top leadership is resisting, uh, then the, the likelihood of long-term success of an initiative is obviously going to be limited. So it's always best if the top leadership is bought in, and that's where we try to work for that reason.
Eric, good question here. So what do you use to quantify the levels of performance 2.7 to 3.3? I was hoping someone would ask that because I knew I wouldn't remember to cover it. Um, and so this is the leader's assessment. This is the leader's assessment on a one to 10 scale, which I know may feel, I would say it's qualitative, but it's based on quantitative numbers. So the leadership, and you can use, the, okay, so the short answer is you can use different things here. You can actually use the scores from the leadership mirror 360 feedback. You can use a qualitative one to 10 scale. You can use other instruments in there. Uh, I use the LPI, which stands for Leadership Practices Inventory, which is part of the Koozies and Posner Leadership Challenge uh, 360 feedback. So you can use different things to quantify that. In the absence of the ability to be able to do that, you can use the leader's assessment of where they're at on that competency on a one to 10 scale, because the real idea is to establish where they want to be, the challenge theme or a goal, help them declare where they're at right now, and then iterate to, to improve that. So as they're seeing that improvement in the coaching workbook, there's a tab in there for you to just not justify, but to document what are the things that you've done or the things that have changed that justify that improved score. Really good question, Eric. Also, there are other assessments that I used in the context of this process. I use StrengthsFinder quite a lot. The idea is helping the leader, be, you know, leverage those strengths and become more of what they already are. We also use TKI conflict management quite often um, because we find that it's really helpful to help people understand their primary modes in conflict and the other modes that are available to them. Other questions? Yeah, I have a question regarding uh, or clarification because um, typically, or not typically, but from what I understand, the uh, continuous improvement effort is usually company-wide and uh, you know it's, it's linked with the vision where the company is going have people from i think various different departments um coming in to kind of a continuous improvement team i guess um to it's kind of hosh and connery i think aligning everything together but then how does you know um if you don't fit into that com company-wide uh, effort then uh, can individual teams do continuous improvement? Um, I'm kind of need a bit of clarity on that issue. I think it's a wonderful question. And the answer is yes to all of those things. Just like the question on leadership team resistance, this is always going to be more successful whenever you're starting with top leadership. You mentioned Hoshin Connery, if there's a master plan. So, and Bland earlier on met, mentioned alignment. It's always best when you can start with that leadership team, have a plan. You can call it a strategic plan. Strategy is basically just, strat, you know, it's goals and methods to achieve them, paying attention to the environment, the SWAT kind of stuff, right? So um, it starts with that plan at that level. That's where it is always most successful. And when it's top down driven, we've heard that and, and it's true. And an individual leader, can pull this process in and improve their leadership in the absence of that. It's always more effective when you're starting at that higher level of system. Other questions? Hey, Keith, this is Blant. Just, I mean, just give us some context. So, I mean, how widely adopted is this methodology um, you know, is it, is it new? Has it been around? I know, I know the Rother thing has been around a long time, but it's always been applied to processes and not so much people development. So this seems to be uh, another layer down on that, but I mean, wh where does this fit in the, in the pantheon of improvement um, uh, methods? Blaine, it's a good question, and you're right. So the idea of the improvement path, uh, if you know, really, this is how anything is improved. If you think about it, Mike Rother codified what he was observing at Toyota, right? He worked with Toyota. He uh, and, and their, his Japanese counterpart were the leaders of Numi Motors out in California, that joint venture between General Motors and Toyota, and he studied the Toyota production system, and what he codified was their improvement in uh, engine. What we were all doing was trying to copy their tools, and he 
he saw the engine, the improvement engine that was behind that, that they didn't have words for. They didn't articulate it because it was just what they did. That's not a new thing. It's as old as Toyota. And the idea of this is how improvement works is probably as old as man. The idea of coupling the concept of the improvement path, that uh, Toyota model or the Roth Rother Kata model, to leadership addressing these obstacles is a fairly new construct. This has been something that I've just been pulling together in my head in the last seven years of bumping up against these lean tools and working with companies in that space and also in the leadership space. So you guys are getting in, I would say, pretty close to the ground floor of this as old, you know, older things that are pulled together in a new, a new vision and a new way. Other questions? I'm gonna pop something in the chat here. So there's a couple opportunities if this is something that's interesting to you. We've got a leadership essentials course that's coming up starting May 13th, which is gonna be four of these DDI modules and coaching in some parts of the TLI process. Now, because it's being ha happening virtual, there are gonna be some components of that that we won't be able to access the complete model in the way I've described it here. The other thing is obviously I'll be following up with the participants in an email. And if there's an interest in doing this specifically for your organization, we can talk about doing that. So you can either sign up and get a taste of this in the virtual classroom. That's a really good uh, venue for people who only have a couple of leaders and they don't really you know, wanna bring in a whole, a whole initiative to the plant or to the operation, then you can do it. Uh, you kind of sample that in the Leadership Essentials uh, course that's coming up starting May 13th. And I, I provided the link in the chat to that. So that's an a couple of opportunities. And since we have a little bit of time left here, this may take a little longer than five or six minutes. And for those who want to stay on, you're welcome to do that. But I'm actually gonna kick it over to um, David Rea out of Catalyst Connect in Pennsylvania, because what he's gonna do is talk about what we're really seeing as the next level of, of feedback. So elevating your feedback game here. So David, you wanna say a few words on that? Yeah, thanks Keith. Um, and again, thanks for having me. Um, as the MEP Center in Southwestern Pennsylvania, we partnered with a local firm called Rabbit Analytics. It's R-H-A-B-I-T Analytics. And if you think about the way um, uh, process and things are measured on the manufacturing floor, you often see visual management, right? Things are measured uh, daily, sometimes hourly, and there's a constant measure of success and potential gaps. So what Rabbit Analytics, Analytics did was to take that, that framework and has uh, incorporated it into organizational health. So Keith, if you don't mind, I'm going to share my screen. I've made your co-host, David, so you should be able to. Okay. Can you see it? Yes. All right. So Rabbit Analytics, um, they, they take organizational health seriously. Um, most companies that we work with might do an employee survey to gauge employee engagement and job satisfaction maybe once a year. Um, they might have stand-up meetings or frequent check-ins with their employees. This tool that we use, we use it internally at Catalyst, but also with our clients. It takes a pulse on organizational health every single week. So every Wednesday morning, our team receives an, uh, a um, text message with a link to uh, a 30 second survey and they use cards. So you get a question and it looks like a card and you swipe right if you agree or swipe left if you disagree. But what it's doing is asking questions about engagement, about communication, about relationship with managers. And so a catalyst, this is our dashboard. You can see that our organizational health score right now is sitting at an 81%. We look at our distribution rate, our participation rate, and we also are able to evaluate individual habits where individuals can get feedback on a weekly basis on how their behaviors and the way they interact with people um, are making an impact. So. I just want to show you a couple of slides here. It's a very uh, robust system, but this is our scores. This is a peek behind our curtain at Catalyst. And um, so this return to work, this is COVID related. And some of these orange blocks um, are actually scores that you want to see low. So I feel it's safe to return to work. 
we know that it's not safe right now. Our state has um, guidelines where we can't return to work just yet. So, but these other questions, I have enough support at home. Uh, I have the flexibility to work at home or the office. We can measure these and, and, tr and look at trends throughout every other week, right? Um, one particular example was a question around job satisfaction and loyalty. And there was a question um, that we looked at that was a complete blind spot for uh, our management team. And as a group of managers, we looked at the question and basically said that managers weren't supporting their teams enough or individuals enough. And so we looked at our span of control and we saw that there were two particular uh, departments where the managers had like 12, 12 direct reports uh, each. And it just was way too much. And we didn't know because we weren't receiving that feedback otherwise. So back in December, we made uh, a structure change. Uh, we made smaller teams and we saw that score improve. Now, so we can look at these individual scores like this uh, 68, right? This 68 here is a catalyst. My manager and I discuss how I pro can progress. Well, this has been going back to uh, February. That was in a bit of an upward trend from low 70s to high 70s. It hit 80. And now recently it's been going down. So when we talk about, uh, we have our managers meetings, we encourage the managers and remind them, hey, it's important that, hey, we have, uh, we have professional development budgets. Make sure that your team members are leveraging those budgets. Make sure that you're talking about progression. And when that happens, when that habit and behavior changes, we see these scores go back up. So it is instant feedback on your management approach, the way you treat employees, um, and how as an organization we can improve to make sure that we're best serving our employees. I'll even go deeper behind the curtain and show you my personal dashboard where I selected several habits, uh, trusted advisor, fairness and inclusion, courage, courageous leadership, uh, supporting the team and developing talent. I have selected a group of Raiders, uh, everybody on my team, plus others that I uh, collaborate with in the organization. So I can see where my strengths and weaknesses are, strengths and development opportunities. So find additional resources. If the team is overtaxed, I'm good to go there. I might need to do a little bit more work here and help the team overcome obstacles without overtaking the task. Um, so I, I know that that's coming back exact that's coming from my team and then I can see over time, and this is looking back uh, probably six or seven weeks in this last quarter, how my approach and how what I actually do through my interactions changes the perceptions of those whom I serve. Um, it really encourages me and encourages others to be a better leader, right? Uh, because Dave, this in the context of the TLI process, this could be used as a real-time feedback mechanism for that iterative journey, couldn't it? Yeah, exactly. And it, it motivates me to be a better leader because I want to see better scores. Uh, the leadership mirror, which is a great tool, we also use that. That's a snapshot in time. That's a deeper level of uh, diag diagnosis on leadership competencies and the opportunity to provide open feedback um, and an opportunity to have a process of self-discovery. And then this is another tool, with, but, but it's more frequent feedback. So those tools combined, just it, my own personal experience helps me to be a better leader because I can understand my blind spots better and I can understand my strengths better and I can reinforce those and, and repeat those strengths. Uh, but certainly address the, the gaps where I could better serve my team. Right on. So we're, we're at the end. We're at 11, I think 1101. So Dave, if you're okay to stay on another minute, anybody that's interested can ask questions of either me or Dave, if you want to stay on a minute. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And I know that we're going to have some people with some hard stops who have other meetings planned and things like that. So if you need to jump off, that's understandable. So we'll just open up the floor to any kind of questions you guys either have about the TLI process or about Rabbit and how uh, Catalyst Connect is using that. Have you um, used uh, storytelling techniques in uh, leadership communications um, in terms of uh, um, uh, communicating values, et cetera, um, uh, and vision across the company-wide? 
um, using storytelling techniques. Um, just wondering if you guys have kind of used them. Well, I like to I like to do story. I tell stories quite often in the leadership training that I do because stories are inherently interesting. And for the reasons that you talked about, they help connect to the practical application that's behind it. Uh, as far as having that as a formalized way of training and development, I, I haven't done anything like that. Uh, see, uh, Keith, if you don't mind, I incorporate that into some of our leadership offerings uh, for peer storytelling. Right, so you have a group mm. of frontline supervisors and you have maybe a new supervisor in there who thinks he, his or her challenge is the worst challenge in the world. But then somebody else tells a story about their challenge and their stories. And it's like, oh, maybe mine isn't so bad. So yeah, I incorporate that a lot, um, but from the learner's perspective. What other questions do you have? We're at the end of our time. I'll follow up to everyone with an email if you have other questions and just didn't get a chance to ask those in the session, or if you want to do any kind of follow up, you'll have a chance to do that. Maria, Jeremy, thank you for joining. Have a good day. So Maria, you had a question here that hasn't been addressed yet. Don't know what that was, but I'll be I'll follow up. Anything that didn't get answered in the session, uh, you guys can hit me up. I'll have my contact information in the email as well. So Dave, Keith, thank her, you. For her question was about the uh, modules and the eight weeks and four modules in the okay. eight weeks. So I put that in the chat uh, while Dave was sharing. So it's actually four modules spread out over eight weeks because the modules are on every other week cycle. Good question. All right. Thank you all, Dave, thanks for your time. Bob, thanks for being producer, the, the man behind the curtain. Talk to you all soon. Thanks guys, thanks Keith. Take, take care.